I'm Charlie and on today's Idol Chat I'm very ecstatic to be able to meet rugby league legend Adrian Mosmorley. And if you don't know a lot about Adrian, let me fill you in. Adrian's career lasted 20 years at the top flight and he was the first Englishman to win grand finals on both sides of the world with Warrington Wolves and Sydney Roosters. He's the most capped England and Great Britain player of all time and he's renowned as one of the hardest sportsmen and possibly the hardest tackler to ever play the game of rugby league. This guy has definitely earned the title of legend. Hi Moz, how are you? Charlie, good to see you Nice mate. to meet you. Well, I know that you're a Manchester lad. Where exactly were you born? I was born just about 100 metres from the Willows, that's where... Salford used to play before they moved to the AJ Bell Stadium, so Salford lad, but Salford virtually is in, in Manchester. If you come out of Manchester Town Centre, you're in Salford, so I've always uh, supported Man United. My mum's from Salford, so she was the, uh, the the football influence, but my dad's from St Helens, which is a rugby league town, and he was the rugby league influence. Tried football, weren't particularly good at it, so tried rugby and I was, found I was a lot better at rugby than football. Well, I'm delighted to hear that you're a red in both rugby and football, but what, what guided you towards rugby instead of football? Well, I just found for my uh, physique, I probably, uh, I was quite a big lad, so it probably suited my style uh, to play rugby league rather than football, but... Uh, I used to love football. I still played for even when I was getting serious about rugby league. I still played football for the school team, and I uh, still supported United. But as soon as I started playing rugby league, that was it for me. That was the the, the only sport. But uh, Brian Robson was my hero uh, <laughs> in the, in, the, in the football world, and uh, they didn't they used to do so good when I was used to watch him. But then, of course, when the Premier League come along, they was uh, the dominant force. Well, good, good to hear that you have some good memories about Manchester United. Anyway, talking about birth, what star sign are you? Taurus. Okay, well that's a bull, isn't it? Maybe you were destined to be a rugby league player. Maybe, yeah, that's, uh, I've never looked at it like that. Yeah, well, did you like school very much? Yeah, well, I was quite good at school. I enjoyed school, but uh, none of my schools are there anymore. My junior school, All Souls, uh, we had a tiny class. There was only eight of us in the class. There was five boys. And, uh, and three girls, uh, and then we went to high school. I laid him out, Carmel. That's um, yeah, that's when I started playing rugby league. Well, that seems like a very tight group. It's often like a sports squad. Do you think that might have helped you when you're in that environment? Yeah, I'd like to think so. It's quite an amazing stat, really. Out of the five boys who uh, went to All Souls, three of us actually made it as professional rugby league players and also played for our countries. There was a uh, Myself and Nathan McAvoy played for England, Carlo Napolitano played for Italy, so uh, yes, quite an amazing, so 60% of the, of the boys in the class uh, made it as pros. That's actually crazy when you think about it, to have such close people who are friends for a lot of their lives, to then go play in the same sport. Anyway, sticking with school, what was your favourite subject? Maths. Um, uh, yeah, I wasn't particularly good at... Uh, anything else other than maths I uh, just had a bit of a I don't know a natural natural talent for it really you've talked a lot about school and how fond you are of it but did you ever get in trouble at it yes but not uh, nothing too serious you know I didn't get suspended or expelled but I was uh, I was a good lad in many ways but just a bit of a jack the lad as well so uh, I knew when to when to behave and when to when to have a laugh so I was quite uh, quite fortunate I was in the the top set in, 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 in all the subjects really so when you're hanging out with smart lads you know you tend not to mess around and, and, and crack on with your work really. Well you just you just told me that you weren't particularly good at anything else but then you just told me you were in the top set do you maybe what uh, what, what changed there? <laughs> um, I'm not sure actually my, my brother's my eldest brother he's a quite smart lad he went to university out of I've got three I've got two bro brothers uh, two of us played professional rugby league the eldest brother, he, uh, he done the degree in university and that kind of thing. So uh, having him as a bit of a role model, he was always smart and, and, and did his uh, did his work. So it probably rubbed off on me a little bit. My other brother, he's uh, certainly not academic. Chris, he's the professional rugby league player. He uh, he didn't get a great deal of uh, grades, but uh, he's good with his hands. He's a uh, tradesman. Well, it's good to hear that you were good at school and also 
brilliant at rugby league. Anyway, I've been doing my research and I've talked to some of your pals and ex-teammates. Well, let's check it out. I played against Mozza once. He was playing for Leeds, I was playing for Salford. You can ask him the rest, Charlie. So go on, Moz, what happened? <laughs> well, that's my best mate, Lee Butler. He's my best man at my wedding. And, um, yeah, it was my f very first game for Leeds Academy. And Butler was playing for Salford. And when you play against your mates, you try and uh, put a shot on them, or, or I used to do. So as, we've, as we've seen, we'll get on right, to that Right, well, sprint, sprint out the line to whack him. And uh, he's a big lad, Lee, and he just put the shoulder down and put me on my backside. So... Uh, he never lets me forget that one, so um, yeah, so I let him have that one. Charlie, make sure you ask him what his most embarrassing knock on was. So go on then, what does he mean? <laughs> I think I know what he's referring to. When I was playing for Leeds, we played against London Broncos, and the game was on Sky, so uh, there was uh, lots of people watching at home. Uh, London kicked off, I was on the dead ball line, and halfback caught it, give it me, so I ran in. <laughs> You know, trying to get a bit of speed up, and um, I remember three of them held me in the tackle. And um, as the, as I was going down, someone actually grabbed my shorts and pulled my shorts up. So my uh, three-piece sweet was on show. And uh, being a uh, quite a proud lad, I just dropped the ball and tried to uh, save me embarrassment. And then, uh, but no one no one seen it. It went to let I showed the coach because I got told off for dropping the ball. I said that's why I dropped the ball, and he. Uh, Fortunately, he found the funny side. We won the game. If we'd have lost, I think we would have got in trouble for that, but he, uh, he let me off. Well, I'm sure he wouldn't have been too happy. Imagine if they'd gone and scored off that. But it doesn't matter now. We look back at it, uh, we look back at it and you were the winner on that day. Hey, Charlie, two questions I wouldn't mind you asking Moz is, the first one is, who's Titsy? And the second one is, what's a Salford sausage? See, <laughs> so you're showing... Quite a bit of laughter in them two <laughs> questions. So first off, who's Titsy? Well, Titsy is a guy, Justin Holbrook. Uh, he had a season at the Roosters, and his nickname was Titsy. I don't know where he got the nickname from, but uh, he was over. He's, he's assistant coach now at the Roosters, and he was over with um, with the Roosters to play a World Club Challenge game. And I've not seen him for 15 years. And you know when you think it's someone, and then uh, I was probably 95% sure it was him. And I went, hey, how are you? And then uh, and I went titsy, <laughs> but then it all went quiet. So I got rattled then thinking, is it titsy or not? And then I just got a bit bit stuttery in the, and I, anyhow pulled for it. He went, that's titsy. And he went, yeah, yeah. I could see he was a bit, uh, he was a bit, he was a bit rattled then. Uh, and the Salford sausage is, um, <laughs> <can> we, uh, <laughs> um, I'd like to think I'm quite. Uh, <laughs> Let me think about the answer here. Um, be careful, be careful. Mark. Be careful, yeah. Um, it's just the name they give me in the showers. Um, Why is that? Because it's. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm quite. Um, Come on, Moz, we've not got long here. I'm a big lad. <laughs> so okay, leave, okay, I guess we'll leave it at that then. Leave it at that. Leave it at that. It at that. <laughs> Funniest experience with Moz, Charlie. You should probably ask him, um, ask Moz about the time they played against myself and Craig Wing whilst he was playing for uh, Great Britain and we were playing for Australia. Um, he took some, um, you know, you might need to ask him that one, Charlie, but he took some big pieces of flesh off Craig's, Craig Wing's um, head at the time and he. <laughs> tried to take some pieces of flesh from somewhere else on my body which I probably won't tell you about. <laughs> so go on then, you explain, where were you trying to take flesh off it? Well, I think I pulled Craig Wing's head, he's a bit of a pretty boy Craig Wing and uh, uh, we're all mates off the field but as soon as you cross that line uh, there's no mates in rugby league, especially when you're playing for Great Britain against the Kangaroos and uh, yeah, I've probably done some things I'm not particularly proud of but I, I grabbed Fitzy in the... Uh, uh, in his most private parts and try to uh, dislodge the balls <laughs> try to uh, you, you do things to try and get an advantage and um, yeah that's what he's uh, insinuating yeah, Fitzy likes the questions about private parts doesn't he? <laughs> he does, he does. <laughs>
The story, um, I suppose you could ask Moz, it's just asking, we go for a little bit longer, but um, just ask Moz if he could tell the story about <laughs> uh, when we were up in North Queensland and I asked someone for, can I borrow your lighter? <laughs> You seem to automatically know exactly what you're talking about there. Uh, <laughs> Tell me, what does that say it mean in your head? Um, I just remember, <laughs> it was after we won the, the, the grand final in Australia, 2002, and we all went away. Uh, there's no better uh, trip away than an end-of-season trip, especially when you've won something. And uh, I remember, he's, he's, a, he's a bit of a... He's a dirty pig, Brian Fletcher. is hilarious, but he, uh, <laughs> I remember he was, it was when you could smoke in pubs, and um, he, was, he was sat there, with his two legs in the air, and he said, uh, I need to fire, <laughs> can you get a, get a lighter? <laughs> so, so, what are you doing? I've never seen it done before. And he you know, shouted to this guy, have you got a lighter? Flicked over, and he'll give it to me. He lit the, uh, lit the lighter, fired, and it was like a bit of a, a Bunsen burner. So, uh, oh, oh. But the guy was just looking in from the other side of the room who, who threw in the lighter, and uh, he said, well, what are you idiots up to? So, yeah, that's the uh, that's the story there. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> just how? I, just crazy. How did he know that was going to happen? Hey, how did he know what you could light? Yeah. Uh, you could, I don't know. I don't know how would... Uh, people like that, they can... Uh, they learn a lot of things that are, uh, yeah, <laughs> that are amusing, but um, you shouldn't even know that. <laughs> how, how do you know it lights? That's a good question. Fair enough. We might have to ask him that. Now, Charlie, if you want to ask Moz something, ask him how come he always turns Chinese when he's had a few beers. <laughs> so, by that, does he mean all the Chinese or talk Chinese? Uh, a bit of both. I'm, um, I'm quite a happy drunk and i am always got a daft grin on my face, but people say I, I look Chinese when I've had a few beers and... Uh, I'm no good trying to hide it from the wife because when I walk in and she says you've had a beer on you so I've got the uh, the squinty eyes going so yeah I uh, don't know about the talking but certainly uh, certainly look like it so the wife whenever she sees you look Chinese she knows you've had a beer she knows I've had a beer she's like Fair uh, enough. yeah she should have been a uh, an investigator Claire nothing much gets past my wife so she uh, she knows everything so being the first Englishman to win grand finals on both sides of the world how does that make you feel? I'm very proud. I remember um, sitting in the changing rooms before the, the grand final in 2002 uh, and reading the programme and the headline was Can Marley Do It? And there's a list of English players who'd played in the grand final and lost. There was about half a dozen and a list of English players who'd played in it and won. Again, about half a dozen and I just thought, I want to be on that list. And uh, thankfully I, uh, I did, did get on the list. And then, yeah, to have, to have won it in England... Um, yeah, you know, there's a couple of Aussies who've done it, but to be the the only Englishman to have done it, I'm uh, very proud of that. Yeah. Well, you've talked a little bit about your success in Australia. What's the best thing you can remember about playing in Australia? That 2002, when we uh, when we won the title, uh, the club had not won it for 27 years, uh, so to be part of that uh, was was a pretty special moment. And uh, I, I love playing in Australia. It's the main sport over there, so. I remember flying in <coughs> to Sydney Airport and it was quite daunting really. There was a flew in at half past six in the morning and there was three three camera crews there and I thought there must be a pop star flying <coughs> flying in or something. Anyhow, they all come running over. Adrian would he give us an interview and uh, the first week I was there probably did about about fifteen interviews either on the phone or in person and because uh, it was big news at the time. There was no since the season started running concurrent there was no English test player to, to go over there and, 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 and try the look so it was quite big news but then the more interviews I did I th the pressure started mounting then you know I thought I better perform here but it went really well the first year didn't go as well as I would have liked I, uh, I broke my arm uh, in the first year and uh, just got a little bit homesick but then the second year that's when we won it and went really well but well, I, lo I loved my time uh, down under it was um, yeah, it was a really, really special part of my life well, you just said uh, the first season didn't go as well as you would have hoped it would have gone. How do you, as a professional athlete, how do you take these setbacks and spur and use them to spur you on into doing what you did? Well, it, it was it was quite tough. You know, there was a lot of hype surrounding me going over, and and it wasn't a total right after. There was a couple of games I was pleased with. I got a man of the match in a couple of games, but just as a whole. You know, wasn't consistent. I got suspended uh, a couple of times, broke my arm, and then at the end of the year, the the coach who brought me out, he got sacked, uh, Graham Murray. 
so then I was in a bit of limbo then but the press were writing a pretty not terrible things but you know stuff you know Marley a flop and you know he's not performed which I couldn't argue with a great deal uh, I come back to the UK to to, um, to play for Great Britain and, and Leeds you know they was on the phone saying we'd, we'd like to have you back it was great they had a, a bit of a, something to fall back on but I just thought no I don't want to come back and say I played in the NRL what come back and say I made an impact so uh, that was the decision I made to go back out there and um, you know give it and give it another shot as it were and it went really well trained really hard and then got used to living away from home and um, the rest was plain sailing then there we go well I'm glad that you have very fond memories of uh, your time in Australia but when I was speaking to your friends both Craig Fitzgibbon and Brian Fletcher singled out your contribution in the 2002 grand final can you tell us about uh, can you tell me about that in your own words yeah I think they they're, they're uh, alluding to the the, the hit they put on um, on our captain Brad Fittler you know he was probably he's up there with the best players I've ever played with Brad Fittler and uh, you know he was our captain our uh, uh, you know used to get us around the field and our, our director and um, it was a real cheap shot the um, I think we went to kick they charged the kick down and knocked him on his backside but then as he was on the floor uh, Richard Villasante dived in and stuck the head on on, um, on Brad it's time to the boot of Brett oh Fiddler oh he's been taken a couple of times and then uh, yeah it was a case of no, no one said anything but it was a case of right we all looked at each other the forward and thought right we're gonna we're gonna do him and then it was a case of who could get our hands on him first and uh, I got I got hold of him and put a pretty decent shot on him now there's Joe oh Villa Sandy um, another lad got hold of him after that so it, it, it spurred us on more than spurring them on it really give us a uh, the edge really to think right you're not you're not treating us or our captain like that and um, you know from that moment on I don't think it was ever in doubt we was going to get the win that day. We've already talked about motivation and how you have used uh, setbacks to spur you on. So for you to do that, especially in a game, to just change the momentum, to say to yourself, right, we're going to win this now, is incredible. But anyway, um, the great Jamie Peacock, who I know is a very good friend of yours, talks about how nice a person you are off the field, in comparison to how you are on the field. How do you do that? Well, it's a... Uh it's quite a quite a brutal sport in, in many ways and you've got to have a certain amount of uh, well you've got to be a bit nasty really to a degree to play the sport and um, you know I, I wasn't particularly skillful but I found I was I was good at being aggressive and I was a fit lad so I thought I'm going to um, be as aggressive and as fit as I can that's my strength so I'm going to use that and um, you know when I used to get you know, as soon as I used to go over that line, it was it was all on really, and um, you know the amount of people who meet uh, off the field and and a chat to him, they say, "Wow, you know, I thought he was a nut." You know, you know, uh, people only see a eighty minute snapshot of of the player, and you know, it looked like a pantomime villain. You know, a lot of the time, you know, get booed off the crowd and all that, but you know that's not the, the 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 real Adrian Marley. You know, that's just me as a as a rugby league player, but. Yeah, the amount of people say, "Wow, I th you know, I expected you to be some sort of, uh, you know, lunatic." But, um, but, but, yeah, you do, you do need to be aggressive. Uh, you can't let anyone take a liberty. But I probably went a bit above and beyond that uh, at, at times. But that was just how I, uh, how I played the game. Fair enough. We've all got contrasting styles, and obviously your style worked very well for you. So I'm glad to see that you were still doing that even till the end of your career. Anyway, what advice would you give a young lad like me who wants to have a good rugby career and maybe be as successful as Adrian Marler? Just try not to have any regrets. Um, you know, I, I tell the young lads now, you know, there's a lot of temptations out there and you don't want to uh, be saying, if only I did this or if only I didn't do that. Do everything you can, what's in your power, to give yourself that shot. Uh, you know, you don't want to be... Uh, eating the wrong foods or going out drinking beer or, or doing because there's a long time between you finish playing to your you know your uh, six foot under for you to be not having any regrets so uh, do everything you can if you don't make the grade at least you can say I, I tried everything and just wasn't good enough but you don't want to be saying oh you know I uh, wish I'd have done things differently and you're too old then and it's uh, I think it'll drive you mad. 
Will you speak about that? Have you got any regrets? A few, a few, but um, um, the, the the positives far outweigh the negatives in my career. I always took training very seriously. I always took playing very seriously. Early on in my career, a lot of the other things I didn't really take seriously, uh, but. I always I can I can look myself in the mirror and say I always put hundred percent in at training. Uh, probably weren't as professional as I should have been, but later on in my career, uh, a lot lots of things changed. I got I've been made captain. Me and me, my wife having kids, you know, they all had a real positive effect on my uh, playing career. But a few regrets in terms of uh, sending off, and uh, you know, when you do get sent off or suspended, I felt I was letting my teammates down. A few regrets there, but. Um, as Frank Sinatra says, uh, too few to mention. Well, you were just talking about how you used to train as hard as you could. I find it unreal how the best sports people manage to be able to maintain that level of consistency and also that motivation to go out there and want to be better. How how do you do that? How do you how do you carry on with that? Uh, that's a very good question, that Charlie. But for me, it was. Uh, to, to get respect off my peers, um, I wanted to be the best. Uh, I wanted to be the best in my position. I wanted to play for England. I wanted to play for Great Britain. And when I did play for Great Britain and England, I, I wanted to stay there. So it was a bit of a. Uh, that was my motivation. That was my challenge. I wanted to to uh, maintain my spot. So yeah, it is uh, quite monotonous and it's repetitive all the training. But if you want to, uh, you know, remain at the highest level. You've, you've got to do these things, but to be fair, I was quite um, quite gifted uh, fitness-wise. I used to drive all the lads mad, really, because I used to, you know, uh, when we did fitness, I, 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 more often than not, win win it. And uh, yeah, the lads they, they trained the backs out all pre-season, and if I did have an operation and missed a load, I'd come back and <laughs> having done no training, still uh, still walk with the other boy. So it is. I was fortunate, however. I didn't use that just because I was good at fitness. I didn't use that as a, I didn't rest on my laurels. I always used to used to used to put it in as well. Okay, so we've talked about the goods. We've talked about a little bit of the bad. Can you just tell me what, if you had to pick one moment, what is your proudest moment being a rugby player? Proudest moment was, um, it's very special representing your country um, in any sport or in any walk of life. Um, representing my country when you get up with uh, 17 other lads and sing the national anthem and all the hairs on your, your neck stand up uh, representing my country but uh, I got asked to, to captain uh, Great Britain which for me growing up rugby league was Great Britain uh, you know I've played for England and although I was extremely proud for me uh, it was it was Great Britain you know that was the uh, the ultimate and I got asked to captain Great Britain uh, against the French in 2007. And it was at Headingley as well, where I used to play with, with Leeds. Um, yeah, and we got the win and managed to score a try. So uh, that 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 game was my um, uh, favourite game and my proudest moment. Well, obviously, you talk about how proud it was to play for Great Britain and England. Uh, you've also played at some incredible clubs, and you have turned them into winners. You have gone there and said, right, I'm here now and we're going to win. You have. So what was it a really hard decision? How long did it take you to decide to finally hang up your boots and finally say, I've had it? Um, well, I was, I was starting to feel, um, after games, I was starting to feel it a little bit more the day after and, and that, but I was still... Um, I was still pleased with my performances in my heart of hearts. I knew they had dipped to a degree. You know, I set myself some, um, uh, you know, real hard tasks, and uh, probably uh, probably was slipping slightly. But um, the coach, he wanted me to play on. Um, you know, he said you're a good influence around the club. I was still one of the fittest forwards there, and uh, it was tempting, you know, because I still loved training, I still loved playing. Uh, and, but the defining point was, um, so I was debating whether to play on, but then um, last year in the middle eights we played Bradford away and I uh, got a whack on my neck and on my neck went numb and on my eye went numb and it was a bit of a concern there and uh, my little boy Leo was watching and I thought if I get stretched off here in a neck brace it'll break his heart here and um, 
I just thought do we need this anymore I've had a good run with injuries next year maybe the injury might be a bit more serious than this is uh, fortunately the, the injury cleared up it wasn't it wasn't too bad but then I just thought no that's that's me done so once I made the decision it was uh, a bit of a relief really you know um, yeah and um, I had three three farewell games I had my last home game at Salford they made a bit of a bit of a fuss I just had me my third child that week as well so it was quite an emotional week so I had all my three kids on the pitch with me uh, my last club game was away at Hull KR and um, that was great the, the Hull KR fans really they made a um, yeah, you can say what you want about the whole fans, but they, they were they were outstanding. They were singing, singing a song about me as well. And it was it was emotional. But then uh, I, I got to play my final game was um, I guessed it for the Leeds Rhinos against the touring Kiwis, and to finish where it all started twenty years before, uh, it had only in front of twenty thousand people was uh, was quite amazing. So uh, I think the decision to retire was the right one. I'll uh, I'll always miss playing, but you know you can't play forever. Yeah, well, you've just talked about how the whole KR fans welcomed you with such opening arms, even considering that you've never played for them. That just shows how big of an impact you've had on rugby league. <coughs> when you think about that, does, does that rule out <coughs> the idea of a comeback? Um, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it, it does. I mean, it was. I'm really happy with. How it how it finished, and uh, yeah, to to have all the whole KR fans singing. There's only one Adrian Marley. It was like wow, uh, uh, you know they did win the game. All KR. I dare say if Salford would have beat him, they wouldn't have been as gracious. But uh, but it was it was lovely. It really was. It was um, you know it really it really was emotional for me, and um, it did sort of make me think. You know, must have had a uh, must have left left me mark on on this sport. So it was uh, it was great. But I played a game. Um, Jamie Peacock actually, his father passed away uh, last year, so they had a memorial game for his dad, and he asked me to play. It was his amateur club against uh, their local rivals. JP played for his amateur club, and I played for the rivals. But because I was getting itchy feet, you know, about playing again. But having played that game, they was battering each other, and I thought it, it went the other way. I thought I don't want nothing to do with this game anymore. <laughs> and it was quite brutal. But because when you're not conditioned to play, it, you know, I'd had six or seven months out of uh, you know not not training as you should and I just thought no that's me done so the boots are well and truly hung up now pal. Well where exactly did you hang them then? Um, yes yeah, so it was at Headingley so oh in fact well I played that game uh, Leeds the uh, uh, played for uh, Milford against Stanley but but yeah my last professional game was uh, was it was at Milford so uh, you know it, it was it was lovely I sat in the same place where I sat 20 years previous as a 17 year old and I took a you know a minute just to soak everything up and um, uh, it, it, was, it was great and you know, I want to thank um, Lee Rhinos and Gary Hetherington for giving me that opportunity to, uh, to to finish there. Okay so you've just talked a little bit about that last uh, little game that you had with Jamie Peacock it might not have been a professional game but it was def it definitely meant something especially for him um, and did did you give anything to Jamie did you give him any little hard tackles no I didn't actually I Ooh. mean normally you know when you play against someone you know there's a little bit of uh, well a little bit of niggle a little bit of everything that goes with it but I just thought no I thought I'm not you know as a, as a pro I mean I was a bit bit nasty and a bit um, over the top but in that situation I just thought no this, uh, the game's too hard as it is without uh, doing all that well you just talked about your last game already uh, for Leeds Rhinos against New Zealand you, uh, you finished where it all started not many people can say that did you cry though? Um, prop, yeah I think I think I did I think um, I'm a bit of a softie when it comes to my kids and um, I had I just climbed as well uh, I had terrible preparation for the for the game I had just climbed Mount Kilimanjaro uh, the week leading up to the game, so I got back on the Wednesday. Uh, I'd lost nine pound in weight, <laughs> which was uh, weren't great preparation. Trained on the Thursday, played on the Friday, so I was all emotional from this climb as well, because um, that was, you know, certainly was very uh, physically demanding. And then when I had all three, after the game had finished, I had all my three kids on with me, and I'm uh, just thinking, you know, this is it for me, and um, 
yeah there was there was a tear shed I don't mind admitting that it was a great way to finish but yeah I'd really enjoyed every single moment of the um, of the occasion and, and soaked it all in. If you're not coming back how would you if you could decide how the entire rugby world would think about Adrian Morley how would you make it? I'd like to think I was honest an honest player and um, yeah just just give me all really so you know when you get 17 players giving their all you, you, you know, you've always got a chance so I'd like to think I um, give it me all every time I pull the jersey on. Okay well I'm halfway through your book uh, and I've not stopped laughing yet I've got to be honest uh, but it's very <laughs> honest isn't it and I'd just like to ask you is the first chapter actually true? <laughs> Unfortunately it is true I uh, this was uh, before I was you know, be, being asked to captain these clubs, I was probably, you know, I've mentioned before, I, I did things off the field, probably, uh, well, very unprofessional and, you know, things you shouldn't do and uh, had a few run-ins with the law, um, drink driving, that kind of thing, so it is true, but, you know, when I, when I did write it, the publisher said, are you sure you want to put these stories in? But I, and I just thought, yeah, well, they did happen, you know, I'm... Um, you know, hopefully people can learn from this. You know, they might find it funny, but if if it you know it can uh, teach teach a few kids not to do the things I did, and it, as it did happen, I don't want to be a uh, um, you know full of bullshit. I just want to write the truth and, and get it out there. So yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Well, um, obviously, since you've hung up your boots, what are you doing right now? What are you doing? I'm still involved in the sport, which is. Um, you know, I'm delighted to, to, to still be involved. I am an ambassador at Salford, so um, you want to play forever. In my opinion, this is the next best thing. Still involved in the sport and, and my hometown club, Salford. So, sort of uh, a bit of a football manager to the to the players. Um, you know, anything they need, I'll I'll try and facilitate that. And then uh, on the commercial side, trying to get new sponsorship in, trying to raise the profile of the club and. And that kind of thing, but it's it's good. It's a full time role, and uh, I'm there every day, and I'm, I'm enjoying it. Well, I'd obviously I'd endorse that Salford is a great club, and obviously rugby league, it's a brilliant sport because there's just so much to do in it. You can be small and quick, and you can still be involved in it, and you can be tall and strong, and you can still be involved in it. So it doesn't matter really what body shape you are. You can play rugby league, and I want a lot of kids out there to know that. Anyway. Thanks, Moz, for your time. Um, I can see, I can honestly see now why you're so highly thought of within the game of rugby league. And I hope that I don't damage your hard man reputation too much by just saying what a nice guy you are. Cheers, Moz. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you for watching this video, and please come over to my channel, Charlie is a Red, and subscribe and like the video, and let me know down below in the comments what you think about the legend that is Adrian Moore.